Welcome to Lawmen, a podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm James Shakeshaft. And I'm Alastair Beckett King. And I'm an idiot. Yes, have you got an apology to make there, James? When we recorded this episode, I made an error. I did not check my inputs and I recorded it on a much lower quality microphone. Was that error recording the whole thing in a well, James? Basically, it sounds like no one told me that I wasn't supposed to record a podcast in a well. <laughs> So we've got some poor sound quality from you, but I think it's more than made up for by the quality of the story. That's the thing. That's why this hasn't been binned off. It's the peddler of Swatham. Hello. Hello, Alistair. Hi, James. I wondered, can you tell that I'm pronouncing the D? in your name. No, are you, are you pronouncing the D in Alastair? That's very thoughtful of you. I'm always definitely trying to pronounce the D, Alastair. Since I came down south, I've noticed people making an effort to pronounce the D. Mm. In the north, everyone just says Alastair. Nobody made any effort to say Alastair. Alastair. I get a lot of Alastairs down here. Oh, look, it's Alastair. Here comes Alastair. Alastair. It's the same name. You should say it the same. But it's spelt funny. It's not spelled funny. The other Alistairs are wrong. It's got an alas in it as well, which makes me f- sort of feel a little bit sad for you sometimes. Yeah, I think that explains my natural melancholy. Alas. It could be a case of nominative determinism. Friend of the podcast, nominative determinism. <laughs> I'd keep it well away from that friend, that so-called friend. <laughs> Why is that, James Shakeshaft? <laughs> no reason. Is it Shake Shaft? Or is it Shakes Shaft, do you think? Shakes Haft. So you think it's Shakes Haft? It's the handle of a knife, axe, or spear. It's the same root as Shakespeare, and it is that of a pike man. It's not with Shakespeare, it's not he shakes a pear. No, no, that'd be absurd. The guy shook a spear. Oh, he shakes pear, wouldn't it? He shakes a pear. It's like, what, what are you, a, a lazy orchard worker? <laughs> Climb the tree and pick them. Don't just shake them. He's just trying to get across his anger at the texture of a pear. It's mealy mouthfeel. Oh, I like a pear. Oh, too mealy. I once had a bad day turned around just by having a pear at the right moment. What? I was really, really down and I just ate a pear. It was just one of the best pears I've ever eaten. And all the all the joy, it absorbed all of the sun's energy and it, all of the joy in the pair transferred directly to me. Hold on, hold on. Have you been bought, Alistair? Are you in the pocket of Big Pair? Big Pair. <laughs> yes, yeah. If, it's, if this is a sponsorship, we have to say on the podcast... This episode is brought to you by Pair. Big Pair. The conference pair. What's a conference pair? I, do, I think it's like a business pair. A, a business pair? That's the type of pair. One of the types of pair. It's the one with the sort of mucky coat. It looks like it's got mud on it sometimes. Mm. It's very matte finish. A pear is like a matte apple, I-M-H-O. You can get some matte apples, though, James. Mapples? There are matte apples. No, I want a jazz apple if I'm having an apple. <laughs> I want something that's out there zinging. Like the jazz apple or the pink lady, one of the ones that has a sort of a Soho vibe to it. Yeah. Oh, Granny Smith, she's a saucy granny. <laughs> she's got bite. <laughs> Keep your apples in the fridge for extra zing. I, I, well, I, I don't want to be too thrilling, but um, I have quite sensitive teeth because of the acid in an apple. Mm. I'm already taking a risk. So if that apple is refrigerated, uh, it's just too much of a risk for me to say. Oh, uh, sorry. Am I infringing on your pear deal at the minute? <laughs> no, I, don't, I, can't, I mustn't uh, talk kindly of apples. I just gum down a pear <laughs> and it brightens my day. <laughs> I like pears. Come down a soft pear. Mm. I was down at Appletown. You're listening to Appletown, the podcast where James and I discuss in extraordinary detail the different qualities of fruits. Uh, the orchard fruits. It's just apples and pears. If only there were a, like a fun saying we could have used as the name of the podcast. Ah, if only we had a Cockney on who was just baffled. <laughs> <laughs> I think this has been one of the most to-the-point intros we've ever done. Yeah. 
This is like five minutes of pure orchard. <laughs> I want you to leave that in after this has been edited down to like 30 seconds of just us <laughs> saying the word pear at each other. <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe it's not apples. I've been bought by Big Apple. Not New York. They really want me to point out that, <laughs> that they're, they're, they're not affiliated with the American city, New York. It's a real branding problem. Now, I've got loads to tell you about, Alistair. I can't believe I'm waffling on about delicious, delicious apples. And pears. And pears. I've got a main tale for you and some subsidiary tales. Just going to ease us in with a little subsidiary one, if that's okay. I got this from the Dictionary of British Folk Tales by Catherine M. Briggs. This comes from the section called The Supernatural. It cites its sources really clearly, which is nice. Uh, This is from a publication collected together by Augustus Hare called In My Solitary Life. Augustus Hare? Augustus Hare. H-E-R-E, like the animal. And he wrote a pamphlet called In My Solitary Life. Yep. This is a sad story already. I can picture his pince-nez glasses. Is that how you pronounce it? Pinch-nez? Yeah, I think. The little ones, the little Poirot glasses. I think it's, yeah, pince-nez. Poor little Augustus Hare. Well, he was chatting to a Mrs Butler and he got this story. She lived in Ireland with her family. And one night she dreamt of a house, a beautiful house. And she woke up the next morning and said to her husband, I've dreamt of an amazing house. I absolutely love it. And she kept dreaming of it night after night and talking about it. So much so, she would say that she would count the hours until bedtime that she may get back to the house. Wow. That is almost rude to her husband, I think. Yeah. Well, her family apparently started taking a mickey out of her for this house as well. So maybe it was a little bit of a... A riposte to that. A way up to bed to spend some time in the house, are you? <laughs> That's what they might have said. Ah, she's always after going to the imaginary house of dreams. Oh, she's after sleeping her life away, isn't she? <laughs> I was just trying to lure you into doing your Irish accent there, James. That's all I was trying to do. Unfortunately, I don't think these are accurate accents for Mrs Butler because the next part of the story says that the butlers grew weary of their life in Ireland. And I quote, The district was wild and disturbed, The people were insolent and ungrateful. I think it sounds like Ireland grew weary of the butlers there. (laughs) Yeah, I'm very much on the side of the insolent Irish people in this case. Yeah, me too. I don't find that very plausible. Why why did you leave that area? Ah, just uh, insolence. Mm. The general insolence of the people there. The lack of gratefulness. So they went looking in that London for houses. And they went to view a surprisingly cheap house in Hampshire. I love surprisingly cheap houses. You are just guaranteed body in the wall (laughs) if you're getting a surprisingly cheap house. Well, as they came up to it, she was like, this is my dream house. When they were getting shown around by the house keeper she actually started showing the housekeeper around the house saying oh the conservatory's through here down here we've got the pantry which is amazing but also sounds really annoying don't show the housekeeper around her own house if you've ever dealt with estate agents (laughs) sometimes you do have to do their job for them (laughs) they came across a door in an upstairs passage that she didn't recognize and she said but that door isn't in my house and the housekeeper said i don't know what you're talking about about the your house thing But this is a new door. It's only been here six weeks. And then Mm. they started to inquire as to why the house was so oddly cheap. Oh, it's important to put out here. When they arrived at the house, the housekeeper had slightly sort of jumped. She'd been a little startled. Uh, Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, of course, you're the people who've come to see the house. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, oh, my goodness. Yes. Oh, is it today already? Please don't interpret this as insolence or ungratefulness. (laughs) Please don't interpret this as foreboding in any way. (laughs) So they asked why so cheap and the housekeeper said, it's because the house is haunted. Wow, she just just came out and said it. She just came straight out and said it. And she said, but you guys don't need to worry because the ghost that haunts it, Mrs. Butler, is you. (gasps) What? Hold on. I'm confused. <laughs> I, I was scared and shocked and now I'm confused. The ghost that haunts it, Mrs. Butler, is you. Yeah. So when she'd been dreaming about the house, she'd been in the house as a spirit. Oh, she was the ghost when she was asleep. Yeah, but it was an alive Mrs. Butler who was asleep. But they didn't know about Mrs. Butler and the need for silence and gratefulness around her. <laughs> <laughs> so the housekeeper had seen Mrs. Butler wandering around the house as a ghost. Night after night, and presumed that was a ghost, as you would, or probably a, a break-in. So Mrs. Butler was gifted with the capacity for astral projection. Yes. And she used it to get a head start in the London property market. For house hunting. Which can be very competitive. Her astral projection has been made redundant 
by Zoopla. <laughs> We're not affiliated with Zoopla. Nah, nah, just have a pair and don't think about it. <laughs> have a lovely, love, refreshing pair. Just have a delicious pair. Have a horrible, mealy, wet pair. That was one of my little amuse bouches. Because today, Alistair, I want to talk to you about dreams. Like hopes for the future? Uh, One day someone might listen to an episode of this podcast. I mean, there's dreams and then there's fantasies. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, all right, sorry. I completely disagree when people say that it's boring to hear about other people's dreams. You don't agree with uh, that? Not at all. Not one, not a jot. I love it. People seem to forget that they're basically just giving you a glimpse into their subconscious and you can just be all total judgy on them and, and their internal thought. I think it's great fun. Like if someone tells you they had a dream that they bit into a delicious apple, Apple, but their teeth were made out of soft cheese and just smeared on the apple. Yeah. You're like, yeah. oh, I see what's happening here. You want a, you want a lovely, lovely pair. <laughs> They're softer. Gum down their mealy, mealy flesh. Look, the agreed wording with big pair was not gum down the mealy flesh. So steer clear of gum down altogether. <laughs> While dreaming, I did once invent the popular quiz show format, Bassist or Racist. <laughs> I think we've talked about this before because I've talked about, I had a chat with someone who told me a joke in my dreams and I've been too afraid to tell that joke for fear of being accused of plagiarism. Mm. So you heard the joke in your dream? Yeah, it was about the guy that invented the automatic gearbox who insisted on naming it after himself, but his name was Emmanuel. <laughs> and it never took off or something like that. I, I think we were, you know, spitballing the idea. Mm. So I think, to be honest, I have some claim to that joke. Yeah. Once it becomes a joke, uh, if I at any point turn it into a joke. <laughs> <laughs> have we talked about bassist or racist on the podcast before then? Do we I have... feel like we have. I feel I... like we might have. Yeah. So it's okay. It's copyrighted. Maybe we dreamt we talked about it in the dream podcast record I, I mean i forget just like you forget a dream the moment you wake up i forget everything in every episode of the podcast the instant it's released so that was a tale called the dream house mrs butler did manage to buy her dream house the dream house thing is a big part of hey we're gonna help you find your dream house yeah because my dream house turns into a hotel halfway through that hasn't got any stairs in it and is also being attacked by sort of malevolent <laughs> gremlins kind of a combination of lord of the rings three and faulty towers absolutely nobody calls it lord of the rings three i've no <laughs> idea what film you mean that's the first time anybody has said those words. Lord of the Rings 3. Lord of the Rings 3, the one with all the fighting Lord in. Lord of the Rings 3? With all the fighting I think in. you mean Return of the King. I don't even like these films and you're making me seem like a nerd. I don't like these films. <laughs> Lord of the Rings 3, the king inning. <laughs> Lord of the Rings 3, the one with all the endings. Okay, so the main story I want to tell you is the peddler of Swaffham. Swaffham? I hardly know him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Carry on. Where's Swaffham? I only know of Swaffham from Alan Partridge, so I assume it's in Norfolk. Ah, so we're out east on England's bun. Yeah, the bun of the witch's head, if you follow my directions. It's in Norfolk. And in Swaffham, there lived a peddler. What is a peddler? It's someone who sells trinkets and things. Peddling is just selling. Not a cyclist. <laughs> Not a cyclist. It's, spelled, it's even spelled differently. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Go, goes around, little blanket, lays out their wares, pedals the wares. Pedals them wares. Yeah. Anyway, so, oh, by the way, this is from Abraham Della Prime's diary. Abraham Della Prime, you are knocking it out of the park with the names of the people who wrote this nonsense. Uh, the Peddler of Swaffham, I think this is a reasonably well-known tale, but I'd never heard it before, and I presume you haven't, because you haven't gone, oh yeah, I know that. Never heard of it. So, there was a guy from Swaffham, a peddler, and he dreamt that if he went to London Bridge and stood there, he'd hear very joyful news. Okay, that's vague. And at first he thought, nah, that's weird. Then he dreamt the dream again and again. It also sounds like it's just that someone told him about this in the dream. Yeah. He doesn't know what the news is. It's more like someone comes in and goes, if you go to London Bridge, you're going to hear some good news, rather than he dreamt that he went to London Bridge and heard good news. Yeah, it's hard to communicate the good news without being specific about what the good news is. Mm, exactly. This vexed him so much, he decided to go to that London and go to that London Bridge Presumably, first of all, he went to Tower Bridge. Yeah, a bit of confusion there. Went to the very boring London Bridge. Well, actually, he, probably might have, he probably would have come into Liverpool Street. Yeah. 
I would think if he's in Norfolk. Checks out. And then yeah, then just a central line to Bank. Yeah, I reckon, yeah. yeah. And that's... then Northern Line down to London Bridge. Yeah. It could easily it could be just as quick to get the bus from Liverpool Street if he was there in the middle of the day. If he can avoid rush hour, he could save time and avoid the tube. He's not going to have downloaded a London bus app before he goes. No. I think he's just going to get there, get straight on the tube. That's what you do. Yeah, all right, yeah, okay. If you're coming from out of town. Mm, yeah. Maybe he just banged it into Google Maps. It, it doesn't specify, but he did end up at the bridge. It says he stood <laughs> on the bridge for two or three days. <laughs> wow. I, I've got a strong sense of how swiftly his good news arrived. And he was, he says, looking about him, but heard nothing <laughs> that might yield him any comfort. A hopeful expression on his face. Huh? Huh? Like hen parties in limousines going past. <laughs> huh? Oh, that's not good I think news. he might have tried peddling because a, sh- a local shopkeeper saw him. Would this be at the time when they had shops on London Bridge? Maybe. Because but I think my understanding is the bridges of London tended to be full of booths, like wooden huts, so that they were lined either side with, with stalls. So selling something on the bridge wasn't a crazy idea. What well, this shopkeeper noted his fruitless standing. He should have given him a peg. <laughs> yeah, a real run up for that one. Yeah. <laughs> And seeing that he neither sold any wares nor asked any arms. So he wasn't selling, he wasn't begging. He was just just standing, hopefully. Standing, looking around. For two or three days. So the, the shopkeeper begged to know what he was doing there, what his business was. And the peddler answered him honestly. Oi, mate, what are you playing at? I dreamt that if I come to London, go to London Bridge, I'm going to hear some good news. Uh, to which the shopkeeper laughed heartily. <laughs> Yep, now that shopkeeper was a true Londoner. It, it's, he was like, you can't be serious. Did you really come all the way on the train and then tube <laughs> without downloading the bus app just because of a dream? Asked him if he was such a fool as to take a journey on such a silly errand, adding, I'll tell thee, country fellow. I'll do this in the voice. Oh, yeah. could you, yes, could you do one of your classic acting school roles, James? I'll tell thee, country fellow. Last night I dreamt that I was in Swaffham in Norfolk, a place... Utterly unknown to me, where me fought behind a peddler's house in a certain orchard and under a great oak tree, if I digged, I should find a vast treasure. Now think you that I am such a fool as to take a long journey upon me upon the instigation of such a silly dream. No, no, I'm wiser. Therefore, good fellow, learn wit from me and get you home and mind your business. <laughs> wow. So his dream was like a dream gazumping of the other guy's dream. So this peddler from Swaffham, yeah. he went home. He went to the orchard behind his house. He went to the big oak tree in the orchard behind his house and he started digging and he found a massive treasure and grew exceedingly rich. Was that treasure pear seeds? <laughs> <laughs> it being an orchard. The Londoner's dream was the good news. The Londoner, cocky Londoner, thought he was getting one over. It seems unfair to me, like, because the, the Londoner was given that dream. Okay, he didn't follow it. But what, why not just give this guy a dream that there's a treasure in your back garden and cut out the middleman? Well, I think they wanted to show the ease in which that you can catch a train from Swatham. <laughs> to Le- with, also sponsored by train. Well, uh, he grew rich and he rebuilt Swaffham Church and there's a statue of him with a pack on his back, a dog at his heels and his memory is preserved in one of the old glass windows in, oh sorry, and his memory is also preserved in most of the old glass windows, taverns and alehouses of that town and to this day. He's in a lot of them. In most windows there's a picture of this guy <laughs> in Swaffham. Wow. So if we have any, any Swaffham correspondence Any Swaffites. Can they back up that the peddler was there getting one over on a cheeky London cockney. And there is the end of my tale of the peddler of Swaffham. Terrific tale. Okay, there's this other story. There's another story of dreams that I've heard about, but I've only found it in one book um, called Forgotten Folk Tales of the English Counties. Written by Zebediah Pike. Collected by Ruth L. Tung. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the the tungster. So this story, this is a Romany legend, and I've also heard it's incredibly bad luck to talk about it. Oh. So if you don't want to hear this, if you don't want to hear this bad luck, oh, yeah, yeah. skip on three minutes and we'll not bring it up in the scores. I'm quite excited, but now I'm a little bit nervous. It's just an amazing story. Let's hear it. So what it is, it's called the Maple Durham Treasure, and it is a, it's a series of dreams that people have. The dreams occur approximately every 25 or 30 years and they've been noted going back
back 100 years, and this book is written in the 70s. So in 1900, it was dreamt about in Berkshire and in Tame in Oxfordshire. Oh. In the 40s, it was dreamt about in Buckinghamshire, Exmoor. In the late 60s, it was dreamt about in Somerset, London and Devonshire. So we're, I think we're due, there would have been another one in the late 90s, and then we're due another one around now. Yeah, we're due. And what it is, is that someone dreams about a treasure, and it's specifically a treasure on or related to a donkey. Donkey. And there's drawings here. of the, the, It's either gold bars that are kind of wrapped up, or it's like a pack horse satchel with the sides mm. splitting and jewels and gold kind of sticking out a donkey treasure like old school money bags in black leather and they have drawstrings on them and one there's three and one of them's fallen over and the gold is coming out yeah the golden age of the money bag really has passed hasn't it thought to be maybe a roman treasure that got lost in a bog and it's considered to be bad luck to go to dream about it or go and find it. Mm. And yeah, it, it's that big a deal that it comes around every 30 years. Someone dreams of this treasure two or three times in a year. Wow, that's really good. That's That's got like... Um... Uh, weird fiction vibes to it. Yeah. I feel like, a lo- like it could be on like a comet that keeps passing the planet, sending out dreams. Yeah, very peculiar. I like it. And it's like Roko's Basilisk, like you're not allowed to <gasps> talk about it. Don't mug it off. What? <laughs> what about if you talked about it, but in a good way, like bigging him up? It interests me that you said, the point of Roko's Basilisk is that you're not allowed to think about it, not the people are mugging it off. Yes, you can't mug it off. They're not mugging it off. It's like the game, P.S. I just lost the game. <laughs> it is exactly, yes. It's the game, but for people who invest in crypto. Right, Alistair, are you ready to score me? It would be a dream. Oh, lovely. See, yeah? yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, I am. What is your first category? Names. They were good. Weren't they just? They were good. What was it? Augustus Hare. He's a giant rabbit. Rabbits aren't hares. I know, I know. He's got his little piece nares on his nose and they're yeah. jumping around though because it's twitching so. Yeah, and a pocket watch. Just a waistcoat. No other clothes. Yogi bear style. All the bears, Winnie the Pooh. They were bear bears. All, all the top bears just wear, just just on the top. The top bears are a bottom bear. Top bear, bottom bear. The top bears are bear bear bottoms. Are we just right in a Dr. Seuss book? <laughs> <laughs> Abraham Della Prime. Abraham Della Prime. Which I guess is French for the first Abraham. Which he can't possibly have been. We've got Mrs. Butler. I, I have to say, I did not warm to Mrs. Butler. No, she is... Now, maybe I'm reminded of a particular like teaching assistant from my primary school. Oh, really? I, I think there may have been a Mrs. Butler in that vicinity. I don't feel warmly towards her. Did she consider you insolent and ungrateful? I was I was certainly regarded as an insolent and disruptive child, yes. What's that in the lunchbox? Just seven pears? I, you can't have seven <laughs> pears? <laughs> Alistair, you can ask a question unless it's about pears. <laughs> Hand slowly moves down back <laughs> to the desk. Okay, yeah, no, I don't think anyone likes Mrs. Butler. The, the housekeeper jumped when she saw her. Yeah. She haunted Ooh. the house so much that they sold it below market value. And then she was the one that bought that house. Well, I mean, that's basically insider trading. Uh, but would you, if you could, would you haunt your house in order to drive down the price? <laughs> Possible idea for a Channel 4 property show there. <laughs> manifestation, manifestation, manifestation. <laughs> that's very good. Um, so, yeah, come on, names. Peddler of Swatham. Swatham. Just Swatham. say it. Say Swatham and try not to give me a five. Uh, it's Okay, Swatham, it's a four. Okay, then. Supernatural. I think it's 100%. I don't think anything has happened that isn't supernatural. You haven't given me anything even approaching history, and I'm I'm not convinced that whatever his name is, Archibald Pine. Abraham Della Prime. <laughs> I'm not sure who Augustus that is. Hare. I think they might have dreamt all of these stories themselves. Yeah. Very mysterious. Impossible to explain. I think the only bit that is plausible is that no one around the butler's house liked them in Ireland. I also find it plausible that a London shopkeeper was short <laughs> with a tourist. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's five out of five for Supernatural. Yes! Perfect. Okay, my next category. It was just a dream. And the was is 
in caps or bold. Oh, yeah. And then uh, but afterwards, there's in a much smaller font, there's a little question mark in bracket. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. And then after that, and I've changed the color of the font so it's white to match the background of the thing. It says, that's the point, actually, mate, isn't it? And that's the name of the category. Yeah, that's the name of the category in full. Right, okay. It was just a dream, brackets, question mark, and then hidden sort of semi-visible text. That's the point, actually, mate. That's actually very much the point, mate. Yeah, or the one of them. Something like that. We'll, we'll sort it out. Um, that was a really bad category. What? That's just some really poor work there. Came to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's no basis or racist. <laughs> Can you explain what the category means? What it is, is normally your complaint about my stories. Yeah. Well, that was just a dream. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because someone's lying in bed and then they, quote, wake up and see a ghost and then go straight back to sleep because it was a dream. Yes, I say that a lot. But this, Alistair, what I've done here, Alistair, I've cleverly sidestepped it because it was just a dream that was is in capitals you've pulled the rug out from under my feet yeah you've ripped the counterpane off the bed would sir like his petard <laughs> oh no it's not gonna hoist me is it yoink <laughs> yes you're right that is what i always complain about and wow oh, you built it in it's five out of five yes it was all a dream and that was the point because they were dreams very much the point mate I thought that was a bad category, but actually, you've you absolutely played me. You mm -hmm. played me like a Cockney shopkeeper plays a Norfolk tourist. I've played you like the demo button on the Casio keyboard in the music room when I was at school. A lot. To the point that someone in authority had to complain. All ten of them in the room just running around pressing them all. <laughs> They're not going to be in sync. Oh, no. It's horrible. I spent so much time thinking of that last category. I couldn't think of another category but i've one has just been texted to me it's the category of pairs i oh, sorry I've, uh -uh. Got, I've got big pair on the phone and they want to know if you're <laughs> going to give me less than five out of five for pairs well i mean there were several pairs in the story you know um mrs butler and her counterpart there's the pair of people on the bridge having a conversation yeah yes they had their, their dreams were in a pair he stayed there for a pair of days and there's you and me two white guys with a podcast what? My pair of accents that I can do. <laughs> yeah. And of course, uh, at the end of it all, there is um, the delicious pear itself. The mealy, mealy wet. The, the sweet. It sort of feels like it's already been bruised. It's the consistency of a bruised apple. I just, where, I don't know where you're getting your pears. It's just, it doesn't sound like you've had good pear. It's five. You know what, Alistair? Looking back on it with hindsight, I think I was just sold a squashed apple. <laughs> <laughs> James, I've got a little apology after that. <gasps> Swatham doesn't have a train station. Oh. You have to get a bus to Peterborough and then you come in to King's Cross St Pancras. So <sighs> everything I said in this episode about travelling in London was wrong. Thank you for attempting to take the bullet for me, but I think what people are going to be walking away from this podcast thinking is... Let's get some pears. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to help us get James out of that well, <laughs> you can get on the Patreon if, if you think we've earned it. There is a real fun bonus episode, which you will get access to if you join the Patreon. At patreon.com forward slash lawmenpod. Alistair, can you drop a record scratch in here? What, James, is there no end to your audio vandalism in this episode? What has happened? <laughs> I've got breaking folklore news. <laughs> or record scratch. That's how they do it on the real news, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Is someone handing you a sheet of paper from off screen? Yeah, yes. Remember the Maple Durham treasure? Yeah, yeah, of course. You remember I said I could only find this in one source, a book by Ruth L. Tung. So I did some extra research. I messaged on Twitter Mark from the Folklore Podcast, and he spoke to a colleague who's more familiar with Romany law, and there is no mention of this story outside of this one book. Oh, Now, have you got the internet where you are right now, Alistair? Yes. Yes, I do. Get up Ruth L. Tung's Wikipedia page. Okay, I'm um, Ruth Lindell Tung. Does anything catch your eye there? <gasps> it's got a controversy section! It has. I'm seeing the words problematic figure. Yes. As well as lost to a house fire. Yeah, all a lot of people nowadays think that she made up a lot of her stories. Ooh. More like Ruth L. Forked Tongue. More like Ruth 
lying mm-hmm. with her tongue. That's not as good. It's not as good. She didn't cite her sources, and a lot of her stories only appear in things that she's written and are very much in her style. Her defense was that a lot of her original documents were lost in the house fire. Mm. However, oh. this particular story, it's cleverly got its own alibi built in. It's considered bad luck to talk about it. That's explaining why you're not going to find it anywhere else. Ah, oh, yeah. And you know what happened, Alistair? What happened? We talked about it. And what happened to the sound quality? Yeah, oh, yes, the curse. Yeah, I think the biggest trick Ruth L. Tung ever pulled was convincing the world that that treasure didn't exist, but then also wrote about it in a book for some reason. Some of that should have been in a smaller font that was... Kind of invisible font, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, invisible font, yeah. 